This is Collider Movie Talk, but on today's show, we are talking about the Swamp Thing cancellation because it has implications for the industry overall. On top of that, Halloween 2, the sequel to the last movie, Jason Blum tweeted something about it, so we're going to talk a little bit about that, what our hopes are for that new movie, which appears to be on the way right now. And I get to talk about those two topics with two great guys. We've got Roka and Jay on the desk today. Hello, hello. hello. I'm here with Roka. I like you. I like you. I like you. I like you. Let's keep this vibe going the entire show, <laughs> please, and thank like you. <laughs> All right, so we're digging into Swamp Thing. There is a lot of information, so we're going to take it bit by bit. So after airing one episode of the show last week, DC Universe has reportedly canceled Swamp Thing. DC Universe was having trouble building up its sub. sub- its subscriber base, and with Swamp Thing in particular, in April, we learned that the show's 13-episode count was cut down abruptly to 10 episodes in the middle of production. Mm. It seems as though the cause of the abrupt shutdown was likely due to a paperwork error that caused North Carolina to renege on its promised tax rebate and that that put some budgetary pressure on Warner Brothers. But then we also have the additional report right now from Bloody Disgusting. They say that the series also lost support from executives before it even aired, with those in charge worried about subscribers and also reached, despite the fact that the show had pretty good reviews to start. Bloody Disgusting also reports that there were creative differences between several people involved with the show, with some pushing for the series to veer into the horror genre, while others believed it would be be better crafted as a weekly procedural. Going back to the tax credit issue here, Roka, you were yeah. saying you know some folks that work in the area. Yeah. So is there anything you could add to that current situation yeah, to clarify? Is, well, over the last 10 years, this has been building the film community down there and film productions going from LA down there. Of course, we've seen it in Canada as well because of the tax credits that they get, because of the savings that they make. So it makes it easier. We see this with Walking Dead all the time. So this made a lot of sense for a lot of my, a lot of my friends who moved from LA back down to the South have been working consistently. In fact, two of my friends are in Swamp Thing on a couple of episode arcs. So they were able to get this work here because there's so many productions going there. But now with all these rules, these laws being passed recently, things have been building to this situation here. We see it with Georgia and the abortion stuff. Maybe these productions now start to move away from the Southern area and we'll see, but it'll affect the economies in these states pretty uh, 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 severely, I think. It does seem like there's a little bit of confusion mm. with this particular case because it, there were there were tweets going around all day saying mm. something to like up to $40 million wasn't paid to them. And a lot of that has been clarified since. But it does seem like there's confusion in terms of Swamp Thing's application as a pilot versus an entire series. Right. There seems to have been some sort of, uh, of error. I don't know if anybody could point a finger at either Warner Brothers or the state, but there seems to be a little bit of confusion there, which might be part of what happened Mm -hmm. with Swamp Thing to a degree, but it seems like there's a lot of different factors at play, but what you bring up is something that I think could really happen in the Mm -hmm. future, especially if everybody in uh, Georgia decides to move elsewhere. I mean, we also had, uh, we have uh, California basically opening the door with a new opportunity right now, so we had Governor Gavin Newsom recently filmed a video with state assembly member Luz Rivas to to deliver a clear message. They said that this is the moment to come back home. They're crafting an assembly bill that aims to give additional tax incentives to productions that relocate to California from a state that is pending or existing abortion bans. New York's Hudson Valley Film Commission and also the Illinois film community pitched themselves as an alternative as well. So we've got, you mm. know, muddied waters for Swamp Thing's uh, tax situation and then also a significant amount of production possibly leaving Georgia. So everything, it's, it just sounds like there's a major upheaval possibly on the horizon. Oh, yeah, yeah. And it, it, it's interesting when you hear about it because you hear so many people at first, and this is exactly what they'll say, we don't care about Hollywood, but now that Hollywood is about to leave and oh, take yeah. an, extreme, an extreme amount of your economy away, you need it now, unfortunately. And it, it goes again to legislation, and it's crazy how that plays the overall arc. You still have to deal with the people who lose their jobs, unfortunately. 
because that is the biggest one. The actors themselves, the main actors, not not just the supporting role, the main actors, most of them will be all right. Let's just be honest. They're already represented there. Yeah, and, and they're not based out of there. And they're not based out yeah. of there. So they'll be okay. It's the actors who are based in these locations yeah. who move to these locations because A, the cost of living is way cheaper. Mm -hmm. And there is a booming opportunity. So you can be on things you never could have been on being out here in Los Angeles. But now you have all everything changing and everything's coming back here. Disney, when Disney said they may pull out, that was one of the biggest ones. I don't think people understand how mm. big that is, given the fact they use Pinewood Studios for mm. every single Marvel film they film. Mm. And these are big budget productions. And now you go to North Carolina, them saying, hey, we can only give up to $14 million. I don't know what you thought you were gonna get. Literally, somebody had to have a, a discussion somewhere. Like, I don't know why they didn't go to Louisiana unless it's changed. Right. Because Louisiana, at one point, was a big hotbed for them to film shows. Uh, Illinois has become... It's weird with Illinois being in Chicago because you only have a certain amount of productions that film there. Movies will go there because of the scenery, mm. because of the ambiance. But you only have like all of the Chicago's, the Dick Wolf Chicago shows, PD, Law, Fire, Mad, all those. You have Empire that films there, but it's rare. Shameless does as well. But you don't have that much there. It's now you went to the South, those tax breaks, companies wanted that. But then it's like, do we want a tax break or a moral obligation? Well, and there's more here going on too when you look at what you mentioned earlier, Perry, about what the executives being on board with this, not being on board with this, the Warner Media stuff, being involved and also the streaming service, right? We just did a story yesterday uh, where Warner Brothers is not going to Hall or some of their film, DC's not going to Hall H, right? And so it's like, okay, Warner Brothers is missing out on that opportunity. So you've got a, this transition going on behind the scenes. That being said, Jay, you and I are basketball fans. Kobe and Shaq didn't get along. They still nope. won champions. So, like to me, these people are not getting along behind the scenes, and this includes probably James Wan as well. But that's this also whole that mix. Mer the you merger. You still produced a good show. The merger take the merger holds a lot of weight in this too with uh, Warner and AT and T. That holds a lot of weight behind this because now Warner's trying to figure out, all right, what do we have to consolidate because of their streaming site, and they're trying right. to get HBO into it now. But, but if you come back to the show itself, the show was well received. Oh so yeah, the why, show was great. Why cancel it? What is the logic in canceling? Let it find its feet. Let it it's build DC itself. It's DC Universe. Is it just the DC? It is and DC does this universe. mean Doom Patrol's done? Titans is done? Does it mean all these well, shows? Well, I wouldn't start That's sounding those alarms. It might be blowing That's it out of proportion right now, but yeah. it does sound like the executives and the folks in charge over there, they don't really know what the overall landscape for that service needs to be. And it's yeah. also, you know, not even just isolated to them. It's a very confusing time right now where we see certain streaming service having been in the game the, the whole time. Then we also have a juggernaut in Disney Plus coming in. Everyone right. has to rethink their strategy right now mm -hmm. and rethink it for the long term. They had a lot of shows come out the gate real hot, real quick. I don't, they're not revealing numbers. Who knows what they were thinking yeah. when they revealed that very first Swamp Thing episode and what kind of their benchmark was. And for all we know, just overall, the service isn't attracting enough attention. And maybe they're going to use this as an opportunity to, I don't know, save a little money. Because the other thing with Swamp Thing, regardless of how much money they did get back, is whatever they did spend on that, I will say after seeing two episodes, mm -hmm. looked damn good. Yes, that was one did. of my favorite parts of the whole show yeah. was that the production value and in particular the makeup effects and the gory uh -huh. scenes i mean it was reminiscent of the thing to me i'm not saying it looked just as good or just as much as i love that movie but i was impressed there's also another show in the pipeline for dc universe being star girl mm -hmm. star girl yeah so that is really like where does that fall right now yeah. I don't know if they've started production or whatnot. I haven't heard anything about it. They have. My friend Joe is on that show. Okay, so they started so production. Yeah, he, okay, so they started production it, on yeah. that. So it's like, what's going to happen? Will they end up filming all these episodes and then, you know... So here, here's a question for you then. Let's say the situation with Swamp Thing was they spent X amount of dollars. I don't know. Someone was confused about how much money they were going to get back to produce season two. They realized, oh, we don't have enough to keep the bar as high as we did in season one. Why not make one of these other tax rebate programs work for them and move mm -hmm. to a different state. Why, why not just pick it up and go elsewhere? Why well, cancel it outright? That's the thing. In the optics of it, canceling after one episode, one very well-received yes. episode is a bad message to send out to the stability of this situation. And the second episode no is good. After one episode to cancel, yeah, it didn't what, have bad ratings. Actually, what is the thought process yeah. behind? Like, what is the benefit for canceling it's now versus easy, at the very end? It's that easy. We didn't like the, the execs who didn't like it in the beginning. Yeah. You, if you have so this is just the execs giving their content creators it, a big middle finger? Well, it, 
yes, and I think it's a good PR. I think it's a PR move too. If you if you build up the love for the show over ten episodes or twelve, uh, ten episodes, and then you cancel it, then the people involved in it look with, have even more egg on, on their face, face because yep. fans are even angrier for doing that. So you do it now, I guess, to kind of save your face I'm a ha- little I'm bit. I'm having a hard time envisioning which scenario would have more egg on someone's face. Yeah. Yeah. Because this I feels, go back this to feels the like a big middle finger to the content creators, yeah. but also to people who just like saw a new show that well, they never knew of yeah. before well, and got excited about it. Also, yeah. the, the whole episode cut was not a good sign from Jump. Yeah, true. 13 to 10. From 13 to 10 and yeah. then to have Virginia Madsen, one of your stars, go are you ser- go publicly on social media yeah. basically saying, are you serious about this? That was, this was, this show, and I hate to say it this way for people who know I cover all this, it was doomed from Jump. No pun intended to Doom Patrol. Yeah. It was Doom from Jump. Mm-hmm. You know, you had somebody in a high power director. Warner Brothers has this relationship with James Wan. You knew you were going to get the horror out of him. You were good. But then when the execs saw the pilot and were like, eh, we don't get it because they probably doesn't do not understand Swamp Thing. It could always be egos, too. Yeah, Everybody be behind egos. the scenes, clashing, credit differences, all that kind of jazz. Not wanting these people to get even more cachet, more credit for creating a fantastic show. So let's just, just kill it now and move on. And it's Hollywood. It's not a surprise oh, that that's a shame. happening. We got a couple of, uh, of chatters chiming in now regarding the shooting location. Mm. Travis Earl is saying, I live in Vancouver where they film all the WB shows. Come up to Canada. We'll treat you right. I do quite like Vancouver. Lee J. Joyner Jr. wrote, I live in Louisiana. Louisiana, and it's been reported that they are afraid of the movie industry leaving due to the new abortion ban. Mm-hmm. Actually, when I was there yep. in New Orleans, uh, I was in an Uber who was a fil- an Uber driver who was affiliated with the industry, mm. and he expressed the same concern there. Burt Mills also said most of the VA film production is either independent, and there are a few major TV productions that have shot in VA. So yeah. that's kind of the situation in a couple of other areas. So. I don't know. I'm curious to see what More, area winds up popping, Warner given Brothers how everything's can go panning out. To Vancouver, you do all of the Arrowverse shows there. You do everything that's on the CW there. Damn that's, near. That's un American what you're pitching, Jay. <laughs> just keep it here. <laughs> oh, Come no. to Virginia so I can move I, back I, I home. Get Come that. on. I get that's the same <laughs> basic. I should be able to go back to Chicago and I just <laughs> won't. But you see what I'm saying? If you have a location already set that works with you, and I understand that the visual look. Is a, is a big thing. If you don't have a swampy location mm. in Vancouver, then there's an issue. But you could have kept this show. I wonder how much that speaks to these departments just being so completely separate. Because mm. given the success they have had with those shows, yeah. you would think they ha- would have a model that would work and they would know how to budget these appropriately. So why not copy and paste yeah. that kind of working procedure? <sighs> yeah. We, we may be ending to uh, leading to a soft relaunch of this service folded into the WB streaming service where all the DC content now lives on there like we see with Disney Plus and Marvel. We'll see that probably happen with a WB service. And we've talked about that on here mm-hmm. several times. That's oh, yeah. The Warner Brothers streaming app will absorb DC Universe. Yeah. Yeah. It just has to. Especially now. if it's not having the subscribers because those reports steadily come out about the subscriber numbers being low. Mm-hmm. So if it doesn't have it, instead of just count, cutting all your losses, just absorb it into your main your main program your main yeah. streaming service and go from there yeah if you don't have a bunch of new content you're not going to bring a bunch of new people onto your services no. that's the thing yes you can go back and put all the Batman animated series all the old films all Static that stuff shock. on there but people mostly own that already so mm-hmm. the going and having it a streaming service if you don't have enough original content right out the jump you're going to lose subscribers that's well, how it this works this actually just caught my eye I haven't had the chance to dig into this article yet but I'm looking at a piece from the Wall Street Journal right mm. now that says AT&T eyes 16 to 17 a month streaming service and strategy shift a uh, new package is expected to include hbo cinemax and warner brothers content for barely more than hbo's current streaming service wow, so it's 15 yeah it, se- it seems not, like I'll that's the it. direction that they're heading in again everything when people started saying we want to cut the cord yeah you start to get you get this disney plus package you get this that's going to include hulu and you can get the hulu tv with it and then you get the warner media one the the big warner one you have everything you pretty much want. Now drop the prices on the internet streaming, for God's sakes. <laughs> yeah. That but, would be nice. But you see what I'm saying? You have those two, and then it's like you have everything you want. But that, how long are these low prices mm. for them going to last? Is <laughs> it like the, the, that's the next phase. Is they're all no. going to uh-huh. combat, and eventually we're all going to have to figure out which ones are... Do we really want... I'd Net- like to buy Disney for 10 years ahead of time at this price. That's Look, what I'd like to buy. Netflix that would be is the smart thing yeah, if right? that was ever an opportunity. <laughs> Netflix subscription is $70 a month. You're like, I don't know what happened. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> don't say it. Don't yeah, say yeah. it. All right, guys. We got to move on to our next story. 
which of course is the Halloween sequel update. But before we even get there, we got to tell you about a great show you can watch on Collider today. Check it out. Or don't check it out. It's Jedi <laughs> Council. How cool is that? I'm Ken Nance, one of the hosts of Collider Jedi Council. And I'd like to invite you to okay. listen to our show, watch our show. It's on every Thursdays on the Collider video channel. And it's also available in podcast form if you'd like to listen to our sweet voices on Collider Jedi Council, me, Christian Harloff, and a bevy of guests, I say, talk Star Wars. We celebrate Star Wars. We dig into the Star Wars news. We speculate everything about Star Wars, including your questions. So join us on Collider Jedi Council. You're going to have a great time. Oh, hi. In addition to Jedi Council, you also have a brand new episode of Collider Ladies Night coming your way on the Collider Interview YouTube channel. Check that out because it's with Always Be My Maybe director Nanachka Khan. She is incredible. She is taking over the industry in so many ways, in so many wonderful ways. I think her influence and her voice is super strong. So check out our full conversation over on the Collider interview youtube channel all right who's ready to talk halloween i'm always ready to talk yeah. halloween so jason blum took to twitter yesterday and he shared a photo of himself with jamie lee curtis holding a halloween figure with the caption we're discussing stuff of course collider exclusively exclusively revealed earlier this year that blumhouse had entered talks with scott teams to write the screenplay for this new sequel having already written a treatment that got blumhouse's approval it's unclear how far along the new film has got at this point, but Blum's photo would appear to confirm that Jamie Lee Curtis is part of the sequel. And mm. given how that last Halloween movie ended, who would expect anything else? So I guess we'll put this out there right now. Mm. Spoilers, if you haven't seen the 2018 Halloween movie, and you should see it because <laughs> I loved it. Mm. What are you guys hoping for from a Halloween movie? Do you want to see it go forward with the three ladies mm. coming together and I guess Michael returning? Yeah, well, that's got to be the way it goes, isn't it? That's Michael the only returning? way it can and go, yeah, right? Yeah. The three ladies coming together. So you think. Another kick-ass fun thing. <laughs> let's not do anything with the masks like Season of the Witch. Let's yeah, leave let's it all not out. Do, let's let Michael be Michael. Yeah, let and Michael let's, be Michael. Let's let Michael and his sister have the battle. <laughs> please don't do... There's a whole movie about masks that has nothing to do with this <laughs> Halloween thing. And don't lose the gore and the hard R that this film was. Like the... the Because I loved going back to that version of horror that yes. was brutal in the Halloween mythology which we kind of lost as the installments went along so I liked how that scary this film was that happens a lot a movie comes out it makes money and now you have the production crew and then directors like oh we can make some changes here and there mm. don't change them do what worked well, all right. So the interesting thing was I went back because I had interviewed David Gordon Green back when that movie came out. Mm. And one of the things he did tell me is, remember how she had a boyfriend in yeah. the movie? Mm. And you would have thought, like in most horror movies, the boyfriend probably would have died. And he didn't. And he told me that he kept him for a reason. And he had told me that, remember in the movie, he's referred to as Lonnie's son. Mm -hmm. So they could bring a connection from the original back in that respect. And then he also went on a little bit of a, of a long, uh, long thought process here when I was asking him what he was hoping to do in a sequel because they did have plans they had ideas mm. and he said he was busy questioning himself saying do you give them as in the audience uh, what they're expecting or do you challenge them and give them something totally radical that's what I'm always thinking of like how do I meet my own personal desires to do something innovative and kind of effed up and fun and energize myself with the narratives and then he even said what if you did something totally radical what if you did a sequel that was one shot shot like Russian Ark or something totally bizarre. When he name dropped Russian Ark, I'm like, that's that's crazy. You're yeah. off your mind. Yeah. I know he didn't. He probably didn't mean it literally, mm. but the thought of someone going to such a creative extreme <laughs> fascinates me. Sure, and um, <laughs> yeah, I don't think you do that with this. I, I think it's that you just brought this back and got people back in love with the franchise. Don't shoo them that's, away by doing some artistic, like said, independent it, film stuff. If it ain't broke, yeah. don't try to yeah. fix it. Please. Look at Star Wars. Look what they tried to do. That should be the that should be the warning for you or the red flag for <laughs> oh, you. Don't boy. do too I don't much know. with it. It depends, I think, who's involved because Travis Earl, I totally agree with you. Get the Eastbound uh, crew back for the sequel. Mm. I really mm -hmm. do hope that um, Danny McBride and David Gordon Green return for this. I don't think we've got any confirmation on that thus far, right. but I've got my fingers crossed again because I was a huge Danny fan of Danny McBride surprised everybody. 
with this mm. again when he started doing serious somewhat serious roles you're like this is the dude from eastbound and down this is the dude with seth rogan mm-hmm. them and then you heard he was writing halloween you were like wait what mm. and then you saw halloween and you're like oh okay so bring him back again if it ain't broke don't try to fix it who knew that we would be uh Mining comedians for great horror. Jordan uh, first Peele, of all, Brian McBride because, is pretty incredible. No, because comedy as a stand-up Does comedian. Does Jason Siegel have a horror film coming? Why possibly? That he created. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, because because comedians have that mind. Don't we forget go to, Chris Rock. Chris Rock is doing true. Saw. That's right. Comedians have gone. We go to morbid places many times mm-hmm. with our jokes and material. So we have that. Yeah. You don't. I haven't don't. seen you do morbid stuff. I because I try not to okay. on purpose. Okay. <laughs> I like I'm waiting to, to see the, the Jay girl. Washington horror movie. Yeah, I want to see I you do see that. Now I want to see you do stand up during Halloween and have it be like super morbid. Yeah. Challenge accepted. All right, good. I will attend. You let me know where you set that show up and I will be in the front row. Challenge accepted for the Halloween one. But okay. I do have one coming up in August on August 29th. I'll tell you guys about when we close out the show. What a plug. All right, let's jump into some of these live chat questions here. Uh, Luke Nelson, here's another thing I agree with. Judy Greer is such an underrated talent in Hollywood. Yes, yes, she is. And Luke is asking, what other franchises would you like to see her pop up in? The Schmodown. The Schmodown. Oh. <laughs> she, she gave him shit on Twitter. Oh, <laughs> no, really? Judy Greer is great. Oh, yeah. We got her name. Yeah. Oh, that's, I remember that yeah. question, yeah. but... Judy right. Greer's great. She's already in the Marvel franchise, uh, right? Yeah. The MCU being Scott Lang's ex-wife. So she's, she's in the in Jurassic franchise. She's in the Jurassic franchise. She's one of the most franchise. irresponsible, an irresponsible mom ever. ever. And <laughs> like, really, she is. Like, you just let oh, yeah. you. Yeah, that's true. She's in the 13 going on 30 franchise. There should be a sequel to she's that. She's really good in that. I know she is. She's <laughs> great. That Judy's movie. never not good. And the Archer franchise. Hell, make that. Do that live action. I want to give her her. I don't want to put her in an existing franchise. I want her to have her own thing. Yes. Like, sure. I, like she is such she's such a talent when it comes to comedic timing give her her oh, own yeah. let her do what she can do I don't know do. like lead, lead some sort of like rom-com or just comedy mm. franchise I yep. think she I think, I think she people would jump too that. quick and always say she can do a rom-com let her do something just comedic let her just do something yeah. comedic and go from there for, so, for some reason, it may be because it's fresh just in my mind, as far as comedy franchises go, it, it, I immediately went to Bad Moms, which seems oh, like yeah. it suits her uh, style of humor, which is why I just blurted out rom-com, uh, even though think, yeah, it's kind of a rom I don't know. It's uh, not rom- really a romantic comedy now that I say it. If you replace Amy Schumer with Judy Greer in any of those films, they're just as good, if not better. I quite like if, Amy Schumer too. Yeah, but I feel you, pretty is way underrated. Those are those things that I've Judy heard that can so do. Much. Judy can do those things. That's yeah. uh, they need to give her more opportunity for those kinds of things. Roka is trying his hardest to apologize to Judy Greer right I now. Love Judy. I've always loved Judy. <laughs> no, you. You still trying to make up for that not knowing. She a man. had a brunette wig on. I didn't remember. All right, one more question today, guys, from Rick Morris, who's asking. I watched the after. I watched after the wedding, and I wonder what are your favorite indie darlings. Oh. Pressure's on. You better pick something good. Is that the, which one's after the wedding? Is that the Aquafina one or is it? I just no, no. That's the farewell. Oh. After the wedding is Michelle Williams. Okay. So am I thinking about the wrong one now? It played at Sundance. Mm. I think. Uh, favorite. I don't. It, I got one recently. Blind spotting was great. Oh, blind spotting was a great choice. Yeah, but that was because last year we had all of those movies about black people in the police, and you're like, all right, we got to pick one of them. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, I'll do just by favorites already. Last Black Man in San Francisco. That's mm-hmm. out now. Go see that this weekend. That's an indie darling of mine. I interviewed the director and the star on the Deep Cut and Collider Conversations. Those guys are great. We had Jamal Trulove on yesterday on live. Yeah, I heard he was so alive. That film, go see that film. That's my indie darling right now. That's for sure. Can I just say book smart like a million oh, yeah, times right. over? Go see Booksmart if you haven't. That. Seriously, if you see, like, just trust me on this one. I can't imagine anybody walking out of that movie thinking that wasn't worth my money. Right. It's so good. I wish it got more love than it did. All right, that's it. That's all the time we have. <laughs> Guys, thank you so much for being thank here. You. Roka, as always, Jay, very quickly, where's your stand-up happening? August 29th, I am doing one to catch one underground. I'm going to have my big birthday show. It's August 29th. My birthday is the 25th. So it's a big show. I'm doing an hour stand-up comedy. I want everybody to come out. I will have the link up on my Twitter at Mr. Jay Washington. So a very early happy birthday to Jay yeah. Washington right here. Adam in the booth, we love you. Thad, thank you so much for manning the live chat today. Guys, thank you so much for watching this episode of Collider Movie Talk. As always, like and share. It's super helpful. Tell everybody you know about the show in podcast form and on the YouTube channel as well. And then guess what? We're back tomorrow, Friday show, 3 p.m. PT Live. See you then.